I'm going to talk about um, Dragi and Friends. Uh, it doesn't have many friends, but it has many people who observe him by uh, very closely. So I'm going to make four points. Uh, first, I'm going to say something very quick about where we stand today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got to the current situation in terms of uh, power game in the central bank, um, a look at the future, and just leave some open questions for discussion. My main point is that uh, we have been talking as, libertarian about, as libertarians about government, state, lawmakers, and politicians. Um, the danger ahead of us, uh, in my view, is not so much the presence or the activity um, carried out by politicians, but rather what this new breed of uh, uh, self-appointed technocrats are doing. Uh, politicians, in my view, are going slowly into the background and power is being concentrated in the hands of people like Draghi. Uh, technocrats that apparently operate as usual in the name of the common good, but that in contrast with many politicians, especially according to the democratic image, these guys are totally unaccountable. And Draghi is, epitomizes this lack of accountability, which is unfortunately gaining currency throughout Western Europe and my extend to the US. I'm going to concentrate in Western Europe, though. So first, uh, where do we stand? Well, the power of Draghi and his friends, who are not really friends, they're just, um, say, um, servants, perhaps, or grateful uh, correspondents, um, his power comes from the fact that he can do whatever he likes with the uh, money supply and whatever it, uh, the European money supply. And what that has implied is basically the following. He has first um, bailed out governments and bailed out banks. Uh, now he calls the shots for the future. Why has he bailed out governments and why has he bailed out banks? Basically for the same reason. Um, he is part of some kind of revolving door agreement. Remember where Draghi comes from. He comes from the Italian uh, top bureaucracy. He was the general manager of the Ministry of Economics. Um, then he became um, minister for economics. He was a, a director at Goldman Sachs. So he went in and out, and this is a standard practice in that the reason why, well, the, the way these guys operate is that, uh, especially when you have countries that are deep into debt, the big business for them is to enter negotiations with uh, investment banks in order to allocate treasury bills. So basically what these guys do when they are at the ministry, they call Goldman Sachs or other banks, and they say, look, I have, say, 50 billion euros to sell tomorrow morning in order to finance the deficit or to finance the debt. I cannot risk not to sell this debt. How much do you want in order to guarantee these purchases? Which basically means how much do you want in order to transfer my treasury bills from my printing machine to the portfolios of your clients. And they quote a tariff, they quote a price. And since the price is paid by the Italian taxpayers or by taxpayers throughout Europe, uh, why not? You quote your price, somebody else pays, I accept the, the deal. And uh, Regrettably, these guys, the seller, ends up on the board of directors or as being a director or executive manager in the investment bank once he decides to leave his ministerial job. Then they go back to the bank and, uh, well, they go back to politics. He's appoint he, they get appointed, in this case, to the central bank and 
guess what he's going to do? He's going to rescue the banks. So Draghi probably does not care too much about government debts, but he cares a lot about investment banks and commercial banks, which in the past have been buying um, treasury bills from most European countries. So basically, uh, my point is that what Draghi is doing, what Draghi has been doing so by printing euros through these seven, eight years now, has been bailing out the banks to which he was understandably grateful and who contributed to his various appointments. So this is kind of the, the say, hidden agreement, which is not that hidden because it's public. I mean, it's public, his career is known. And it is known that the main beneficiaries have not been governments, but have been the banks. Now, the point is, so this is nothing new. Um, the point is, how did we come to this point in which this, say, technocrats, uh, thanks to revolving door agreements, thanks to acquaintances, thanks to um, doubtful careers from the moral standpoint. How come that our societies are almost admiring this category of people? Well, my explanation goes back to rent seeking. Um, I think Hans yesterday was mentioning the public choice story and rent seeking uh, is what uh, Bastia, uh, Ferrara, and more recently Tullock spoke about. And it is about privileges. Uh, we have been going through, in my view, through th three periods, through three uh, pictures regarding rent seeking. The first period, we can call it the Bismarckian story. And uh, it follow, it, it took, it, it came to the surface in the 19th century, and basically it was a deal between big business and government. The idea was, I'm just summarizing, uh, and you'll forgive me for that, um, the, state, the state government takes care of you, it uh, engages in pursuing the common interest, uh, it diffuses social tensions, it keeps uh, large corporations in check so that people are happy um, and uh, in, as a um, say um, counter weight it helps corporation by gives them privileges by restricting competition and by giving them all kinds of subsidies and by keeping trade unions in check so there is this kind of uh, bargain between the public at large that wants to be taken care of and the large corporations. Rent seeking is the distribution of privileges and lawmakers were by and large controlled by these large corporations who called the shots. Uh, things changed during the 20th century. Once again, I'm not precise, but the important thing is the, um, the, the, the basic notion behind it. Uh, the 20th century was characterized by the expansion of the welfare state and by this expansion of the state bureaucracy. That means, especially in Europe, in Europe that a new coalition, a new interest group comes to the surface, emerges. And this interest group is the bureaucracy. Now, the difference between this period and the previous period is that whereas in the so-called Bismarckian period, the lawmaking class is legitimized and supported by large corporations, in the second period, this rent, the, the, the lawmakers an interest group by itself, actually creates its own support. So the deal is no longer between business and lawmakers, it's between bureaucracy and lawmakers. Um, and the lawmakers turn into the dispenser, the distributors of privileges. So the ranking between business and lawmakers starts to change thanks to this new actor. And the new actor is the bureaucracy.
Um, they don't need support from economic actors anymore. They find support in their own creatures. And this is the beginning of, say, modern cronism, so to speak. You need cronies in order to build your own support from within, thanks to the bureaucracy that you have appointed, that you have created, and that you have subsidized, and that you have protected. Um, so cronism turns into the essence of rent-seeking. That is, you, as a lawmaker, you do not get power and you do not make money out of big business because big business allows you to do so. You do it through the bureaucracy and through the companies that you control through government. So it is, you, you reap the rents through the creation of a large government sector. You don't have to go outside to make, to satisfy your vanity or to satisfy your greed. You create the opportunity and then you extract the rent. How do you make sure that you extract the rent once you have created the opportunity? You appoint cronies. So cronies in this second period becomes the essence of the rent seeking story. Um, what is the problem with this, or what is the next step? The next step is that, is that these cronies end up breaking loose. Once these cronies understand that they have the power to interact with the lawmakers in order to allow them to extract the rents that they are creating, they start asking themselves, why do we need the lawmakers? Why don't we self-perpetuate ourselves? Why don't we carry out our own lawmaking, giving, say, some um, second-hand privileges or uh, something like that to, to the lawmakers? And this is actually what happened. Um, during, say, the last 50 years, until recently, um, the, the, the system has been run by the bureaucrats who have used, for example, regulation in order to expropriate the lawmakers. I don't, I'm not saying that the lawmakers are victims. I'm not saying that they're innocent. But what I'm saying is that they're too dumb not to stop the bureaucrats. And they are too incompetent not to stop the bureaucrats. So eventually, the bureaucrats have taken over. And you see it. Well, I come from Italy, uh, so, and um, I can tell you about Italy, but it happens in most Western European countries. It doesn't really make much of a difference um, whether, say, Berlusconi, Renzi, or somebody else is in power, because the shots are called by the top bureaucrats. The ministers hardly see the documents. They just sign them. And the scandal come to the surface when they find out, which is not very frequent, and when they speak up, which is even less frequent. Um, what happened in Italy recently, and uh, I'm sure it happened elsewhere, is that some ministers woke up one morning and said, oh, how come that now we have this regulation? And they got a fax or an email the next day by the bureaucrat say, I sent it to you a week ago, and you signed it. And they never knew. They never so the, the question is, the bureaucrats, the top bureaucrats have actually Sh say, sh moved aside, pushed aside the lawmakers, and they've taken control. Um, how does this new class of former cronies, because now they have a life of their own, how do they justify themselves, and um, what do they do? Well, the, 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 the new, uh, say, mantra is merit. What does merit mean? That means, in their view, technocratic abilities, technocratic skills. It does not really mean that they're doing the right things. It does not mean that they have a vision. But they, it means that they are so complicated, so convoluted, and so arrogant, they then eventually become unaccountable. And this is where banking and central banking comes in. Once these technocrats 
take power, and Draghi is one of them, and in all regulatory agencies, you have them. So, um, in a way, Draghi's friends are not really the bankers, those are bank Draghi's servants. Uh, Draghi's friends are the head of the various regulatory agencies you have throughout Europe and in, uh, in Brussels, the European Union. Those are his counterparts. Those are part of the same class of people. And of course, they collude. Now, how does this relationship between, say, this central technocrats and the world of banking uh, emerged? Well, the, um, a key word is regulation and supervision. Central bankers can blackmail bankers by making hard very, I'm not justifying bankers, period. However, what I'm trying to explain is what kind of relationship you have between a central banker, a traditional central banker, Draghi being one of those, and a, a private bank or semi-private bank. And the relationship is blackmail. I can, if I'm a central banker, I have supervisory power because the law gives me the power to come to your bank and to make life very difficult for you and to slap fines of all kinds. So if you're a banker, you have to play my game, otherwise I'm going to kill you professionally. Um, among this, well, so on the one hand, you have blackmailing by the central bank. What do you have to do as a banker in order to meet the central bankers' requests. Well, by and large, what Western central bankers had to do is to buy treasury bills. So take deposits, transform those deposits into public debt, and you'll have a happy life. Incidentally, it's also easy because, you know, it's easy to take money from depositors. It's also easy, it's a click, to buy treasury bills and it's even nicer and easier to pocket a bonus at the end of the year. Uh, you pay nothing to depositors. You pay, used to pay, to get a lot of money from interest, um, the, rate, the rate of interest paid on public debts. If you bought Greek public debt, Spanish public debt, Italian public debt until recently, you would make huge amounts of profit, uh, totally safe because you had a guarantee, and even if the guarantee was not credible, who cares? You don't pay the price if you go down. Um, the politicians, if anything, will pay the price. So the deal was easy. I force you, as a central banker, to buy treasury bills. If you have some morality or some principles, I can make life very difficult for you so that in the end your shareholders will kick you out. Um, what is the, let's say, the, the advantage or the benefit for the central banker? Well, of course, they want to promote their own career. These guys, especially when they're relatively young, and Draghi was, um, is still relatively young, but was even younger when he was appointed, he was even younger when he was appointed minister or general manager of the ministry. So they want to make a name, they want to uh, uh, make headlines, and they want to have a political career afterwards. For example, Draghi is currently candidate number one to become president of the Italian Republic once the current president expires. Um, and uh, he was also the first candidate when the former president went out of office, but he declined uh, because um, He's happy where he is, he can make his name, and uh, he knows that uh, he will be number one anyway. So that is my prediction, unless they make him, they appoint him somewhere else, uh, but he might become president of the Italian Republic, which is the top of rent seeking. I mean, beautiful holidays, nothing to do, great palace, horses, and uh, anything you like. That is great. And we cost, incidentally, I think, three times as much as the Queen of England in terms of running expenses of the presidency. So you can understand um, how nice it is to be president. Um, they are, so they want to make a career. 
They want to make a, they want to satisfy the vanity, and they have a debt towards the investment bankers and the bankers um, that helped them in their career in the past. So save the bank, promote their image and make bankers and politicians happy. And this is what Draghi has basically done over the years. Um, he has been pumping money, printing money, that basically went to the banks. Um, he's also been protecting the banks by um, fake stress tests. You all know about the stress test story. Every time a stress test comes out, um, everything, everybody, looks nice, except for a few, say, um, non-conforming banks, perhaps. Uh, the truth is that the European banking system is rotten. And you cannot hide the rot just by showing some statistics, which are complete and criteria that are systematically circumvented. The European Central Bank gives the example for example, right now, Draghi's main problem is to save the European Central Bank. If Greece um, repudiates its debt, which is what Hans and everybody with common sense would say, uh, Italy should do the same, Spain should do the same, France is the same situation. Um, if we repudiated our debt, the balance sheet of the European Central Bank would be broke. That is, the European Central Bank has a balance sheet with assets and liability. If we go broke, the assets, which is government debt, is wiped out. And the European Central Bank is wiped out. So basically, printing money right now is, serves three purposes. Makes politicians happy, makes banks happy because they have easy access to credit, and it makes himself happy because it helps the European Central Bank to survive. Um, so there will be no, um, say, uh, end to this easy monetary policy unless you have a major shakeup. Um, Greece is not enough. You need a big country to go bust. Um, a big country could be Italy, it could be France, um, it might be Spain, but I think the prime candidate right now, candidate, uh, candidate is Italy. And the, um, how could Italy go bust? Well, for example, if interest rate went up, we wouldn't be able to serve our debt and we should repudiate. So debt servicing would go through the roof, which means that Draghi, once again, is forced to enhance an easy, monetary policy in order to keep interest rates down. And it does not do it for growth. This is um, just smoke in the eyes. I mean, this is not a Keynesian story. This is rent-seeking and cronism, which is, might be correlated, but it's not exactly the same thing. He's not keeping interest rates down in order to promote growth. He's keeping interest rate down in order to make, to promote, well, to save troubled countries, including Italy, but not only Italy, and in order to save troubled banks, which means 90% of the banks in the European Union. Um, so you can understand why he is holding a key position and why everybody, virtually uh, almost everybody, is supporting him. Um, where, what is the next step? Well, the next step is that these guys are here to stay. So people like Draghi will multiply. Because in every area of policy making, we are having troubles. And in all areas of policy making, we believe, well, we believe, or they believe, that technocrats have some kind of magic wand and they can replace politicians. Uh, regrettably, we are heading towards uh, some kind of technocratic oligarchy, which is particularly disgraceful, not so much for the term oligarchy, but because these guys operate 
behind um, what we could say a veil of populist democracy. That is, these guys are legitimized by, the, uh, by democratic populism. So they're very difficult to attack because after all, they have some kind of procedural legitimacy, which does not mean substantive legitimacy, but procedural legitimacy makes them acceptable. And the idea according to which, in Draghi's example, by printing money, you make everybody happy at no cost, is very difficult to oppose and is very difficult to counteract. So, um, the open question is, uh, what is next? Or why have we, I mean, what are the grand explanations of, the, of this announced disaster? Well, there are two theories uh, that I've just mentioned now, and then I come to the conclusion. And the two theories are, one is the ideological change. I mean, we've been swept away by an ideological change. The, um, infatuation with populist democracy that dates back probably to the late um, 18th century, uh, the French Revolution, the idea that power for everybody, power to everybody, um, something that even Rousseau was very skeptical about, uh, but they have taken over. And uh, after 200 years, things have gotten worse. So this is the ideological explanation and I don't think that we are on the verge of a new ideological revolution. So this is the first, um, say, uh, take, which means, the, which explains why these technological, well, technocrats are going to stay. The second explanation relates to the unintended consequences of an overblown bureaucracy. Uh, for example, if you need, read Neil Ferguson, he's not against, he is against, first he goes, criticizes um, a heavy state, but he does not criticize the notion of government and the need for a substantial government. And he says, well, the fact that government has led us to unintended consequences is, um, should be an incentive to get things right. And that takes us to the technocrats. So uh, the, um, say the, the, the glitch, or if you want, the, the, the delicate point is that these people, and most of them belong to this Ferguson category, believe that government is good, that things uh, can be better, that things can be fixed, and we should get rid of the old political class and have a new class of uh, people appointed according to merit. Now, these people appointed to merit, quote unquote, are these uh, technocratic bureaucrats that are even worse than the standard politicians, but at least the standard politicians were, uh, say, open, not accountable, but visible. People like Draghi and his friends and these revolving door agreements are neither open nor accountable. And this is regrettably a recipe for disaster. Thank you very much for your attention.